There's a traditional Pali term for concentration. It's called Vihara Dhamma, a home for the mind. It's a place where the mind can stay. But it's more than that. As with any home, there's more to the home than just the bedroom. And there's more to the home than just living in it. First you've got to build it. And for many of us, that's the hardest part right there, getting that home, getting that shelter. You put up a few posts, and then they fall down. Then you put them up again, and they fall down again. But you can't get discouraged, because you realize you need shelter. You need a place to keep your valuables. You need a place to rest, and you need a good sheltered place to work. Otherwise you work out under the hot sun, or in the cold of winter. So you've got to get this shelter, got to get the shelter built. And if you find if you stick with it long enough, at least you can put up something. A few pieces of plywood, wrap some plastic around it, and you've got at least some shelter. And then as you get better and better, how do you keep building yourself a better and better house? Until you've got one that's able to give you shelter from a lot of the, the vagaries of the weather. You've got a comfortable place to stay. But then you've got to maintain it. This is the next difficulty in the practice. For many of us, once we get the mind into concentration, the question is, what next? It just sits there, doesn't do anything. Well, first you've got to learn how to let it sit there and not do anything for long periods of time. That requires skill, making sure you don't get bored, making sure you don't lose your focus. And noticing when it begins to unravel, when it begins to fray, and learning how not to get complacent about these things. So as soon as the slightest leak develops in the roof, you've got to fix it, otherwise mold sets in and the whole house begins to fall apart. And you find that there is a, a skill in maintaining the concentration. You learn a lot about the mind in the course of the maintaining. If you learn how to take the meditation into your daily life, in other words, try to keep your center going as you go through your various activities, you begin to see very clearly where your attachments are, where the asavas are, the things that your mind flows out to. Go barging right through the walls of your concentration. So then you've got a double duty. One is to try to train the mind not to go barging through the walls, and two, to fix up whatever walls have been knocked down. So you're learning both about the mind's defilements and you're learning the skills you need to be a good repair person. As you replace the wall, you learn more about walls. You may be able to take what used to be a plywood wall and put up a more solid one. So the maintaining is an important part of the concentration, and it's a, an important step in developing discernment. But it's important that you not simply use the meditation as a place to hide out at the end of the day or the beginning of the day. 
You try to carry your concentration throughout the day and use it as a way of gauging the movements of the mind and learning whatever skills you need to rein the mind in when you find that it goes barging out. So those are two of the steps in having a home. One is learning how to build it, and the second one is learning how to maintain it. The third one is learning how to put it to use. When you think of it in this way, it's, it's good to think of the home as having several rooms and not just one. For most of us, the concentration is just the bedroom. It's a place you go and you rest. But even there you can learn how to put it to more use than just simply resting. Like the story of the, the princess and the pea. When you lie down on your mattress, are there any peas under the mattress? Can you sense them? In other words, is your bedroom as comfortable as it could be? You can learn a lot just by investigating the bedroom and finding out where there are still irritants. If there's noise outside, how can you insulate the windows so the noise doesn't come in? Like those hotels they have in, in airports where they've learned how to insulate the windows so you don't even know that the planes are coming up or taking off or landing. And what can you do to make the bed more comfortable? There's a lot to be learned right there. But there's more to the house than just the bedroom. It's good to think of it as having an exercise room, a kitchen, a wood shop, a scientific laboratory. In other words, it's a working home, a craftsman's home. And you learn how to use the concentration in various ways. So it's not just a place to rest, but it's also a place where you do your work. And the work can be something very simple, like we're talking about today. If you've got a big problem in daily life, one good way of dealing with a problem is to pose it as a question in your mind before you meditate. Say, at the end of the meditation session, I want to think about this issue, and then put it out of your mind. Of us, don't let your mind go there while you're meditating, while you're trying to get it into concentration. And at the end of the hour, the end of however long the session may be, you bring up the issue. And now you're looking at it from the point of view of a mind that's still, that's been rested, and it should be clearer. Just pose the question in your mind and see what comes up. And you may find that the new perspective of having the mind still and open makes the solution a lot easier to see. There's a common tendency among a lot of people to think that once the mind is in concentration, then you've got to do vipassana. Well, yes, but before you get to the really subtle work of vipassana, you've got other issues in your life that you have to sort out. There's a phenomenon they call spiritual bypassing, where people have big issues in their lives and they don't want to face them. And they use the meditation as an escape. But you can't really deal with the subtle issues of inconstancy, stress, and not-self. And you start sorting through the issues in your daily life. This is one of the reasons, traditionally, they didn't have such things as meditation retreats. You went to monasteries. and monasteries, there was time to meditate, but there were also other duties in the course of the day. You had to interact with the other people in the monastery, to at least some extent. There was work to be done. And in the course of your interactions, in the course of your work, you learned a lot about the Dharma. The Dharma of generosity, the Dharma of virtue, 
the Dharma of patience. Equanimity, goodwill, all these other virtues, which are an essential part of training the mind. The idea of creating meditation retreats was basically late 19th century, early 20th century, the same time that the assembly line was invented. Breaking a job down into little tiny parts that you just do repetitively. And that became the same approach for a lot of meditation retreats. You take one method and you just apply it again and again and again. But a lot gets left out of that, that approach. It's best to think of it as a whole approach. You're training the whole mind. And all the virtues of maturity, heedfulness. In other words, the ability to anticipate dangers, particularly dangers in your own behavior. Suppression, the ability to say no to a state of mind that you know is going to lead you down the wrong path. Traditionally, this is associated with the attitudes of shame and compunction. Otherwise, realizing that an unskillful behavior is really beneath you. Shame here doesn't mean low self-esteem. It actually means very high self-esteem. Realizing your worth as a person should not be squandered on shoddy behavior. Compunction is realizing that if you follow a certain action, the results are going to be bad, so you want to avoid that kind of behavior. There's a quality of what psychologists call sublimation, the ability to, to counteract the desire for an unskillful pleasure by finding a more skillful pleasure to take its place. And this is one of the reasons why we have the practice of concentration. The mind wants pleasure, so give it a pleasure that's harmless, that's blameless, that it can tap into whenever it wants. So the impulse to go after a less skillful pleasure will not be so strong. There's compassion. You have to learn compassion for the people around you, compassion for yourself. And there's a good sense of humor. I don't know the Pali term for sense of humor, but you see it throughout the texts, especially in the Vinaya, the ability to, to laugh at the foibles of human nature that led, led monks and nuns to do unskillful things. Many of the stories really are humorous. And the sort of person who can laugh at that kind of behavior. It's a good nature of humor. It's not nasty or mean. But it's the recognition that we all have those impulses, or we all have had those impulses. And the virtue of humor is it allows you to step back and separate yourself from those things. As the Greeks used to say, the gods laugh. In other words, the gods are up there on Olympus looking down on human beings below. Because there is that sense of distance, they can laugh at human behavior. So when you can laugh at yourself, you're putting yourself in a godlike position. Small g, God. So these are some of the virtues that get developed as you learn how to live wisely with other meditators. Live wisely in the group. Psychologists identify them as what they call healthy ego functioning. And they're very definitely part of the path. So you try to use your concentration as a way to develop these virtues in the course of the day. You take some quiet time, and then you can look at your behavior. This is like having a bedroom and then having a, a workshop right next to the bedroom. You get rested, and then you can go to work. And even though you may not be directly tackling the perception of inconstancy, stress, and not self in the five aggregates, 
you're learning to take a problem-solving approach to issues in your life, which is precisely what the Buddha's attitude is. I mean, the Four Noble Truths are a problem-solving approach. The question of stress and suffering as a whole. And you start applying it first with the obvious issues in your life. You learn to develop all the proper maturity around the application of this teaching. And then the work gets more and more subtle. To the point where your workshop turns into a scientific laboratory and you're learning new things. You take your scientific equipment and learn more and more precise things about what's going on in the mind. Working from the large issues or the blatant issues to the more subtle ones. This is how skill gets developed. You can even extend the image of the house to the point where you start studying the house itself. Take your microscope and look at the beams and the, the carpet. Analyze the the molecules in the air. There's lots of stuff in the house to study. And it's all right here. This is why if you find yourself getting the mind still and wondering, well, what to do next? One, you've got to take care of this stillness. Remember, it's a house. It's not a movie show. You're not looking for entertainment. The house doesn't have to be entertaining. The prime requisite for a house is that it's restful, it's shelter. But then the Buddha saw that you can do more with a house than just find shelter and rest. You can make it a working home. In other words, you not only learn how to build the house and maintain the house, Use it as your place of work, as your, as your workshop. You not only develop concentration, you maintain it, but you also put it to use. I and mean, this was the big difference between the Buddha's approach to concentration and that of his two teachers. His two teachers saw it simply as a place where you rest, and that's it. Whereas the Buddha said, no, you can actually work in here as well. There's more to be done than just resting. You work and analyze. You discover new things about the mind. So it's good to have a large sense of what this image of Vihara Dhamma, or home for the mind, means. You learn how to build it. You learn how to maintain it. And then you use it as your workshop, working from crude problems on up to the more subtle ones. So whatever stage you're in, the building stage, the maintaining stage, or the, the working stage, it's helpful to keep this image in mind. you get the most use out of the home.